Alrighty, folks. Let's see if I can do this video without interruption. What are we going to talk about? Adjusting journal entries. Okay. So, where are we in the so called accounting cycle? They have that on page 335 of their textbook. And I'm just going to run through the different things they have listed here. It says, you enter the transactions of the period in the appropriate journals. So that would be the sales journal, the cash receipts journal, the purchase journal, the cash payments journal, and the general journal. These are the daily, recurring, day-to-day -day transactions, okay? Typically, or sometimes referred to as bookkeeping transactions. Then what does it say to do? Post the journals to the ledger. Okay, that happens instantaneously. Why? Because you're using a computerized system, yeah, software. Okay, uh, you could push a few buttons and take care of number three, which is to prepare an unadjusted trial balance. Okay, now the numbers could be perfect, but they require additional modifications. Now we're up to number four, which is prepare the adjusting journal entries and then post them to the ledger. Okay, so we're gonna go over the adjusting journal entries which again, in a computerized system, as soon as you enter them, bingo, they are immediately posted. And number five can be printed out immediately or just viewed. They're calling the adjusted trial balance. The adjusted trial balance is what you're going to use to prepare the financial statements, number six. Okay. If you're at the end of the year, not the end of a month, but the end of your business year, then you're going to do the closing entries. Are you actually going to be fooling around with income summary and that kind of thing, which you did in accounting one? No. Okay, it's going to push a button. What is it going to do? It's going to close out all the revenue accounts. It's going to close out all of the expense accounts. And it's going to update your retained earnings or capital. Again, number eight, you can push a button and you have a post-closing trial balance. If you, if you were to repair a post-closing trial balance, the only accounts that would have balances would be the so-called balance sheet accounts, the assets, the liabilities, and the owner's equity. Okay, and number nine, reversing entries. Well, I could go on about this for quite a while, but some of the stuff that's in this chapter three is, is really naive, uh, and hopefully we'll be able to give you a much better description. But reversing entries, and particularly in the case of accrued expenses, which I'm gonna talk about in a few minutes, are absolutely going to happen in the real world. Okay, all right. Now maybe I'll do a separate video on that. But for the time being, let's take care of these adjusting journal entries. It's a really important topic. Okay, so I have them categorized: type one, two, three, four, and then on the bottom here, I have accounting estimates. Okay. All right. So now I call this. I categorize these. These are my letters and numbers and so forth. So if you go into an accounting firm, you say, okay, I'm, I'm going to make a type 1A adjusting journal entry. What are they going to say to you? Get out. Okay, so this these uh, numbers and letters only pertain to this class. And you can always refer back to, the, to this uh, illustration. All right, where are we? Okay. December 1st. This is a daily recurring transaction. Bookkeeping. You paid three months' rent in advance, and you probably, but not always, you probably debited prepaid rent, which of course is an asset account, and credited your favorite account, which is cash. This is not an adjusting journal entry, okay? Adjusting your journal entries never have cash in them. Okay, where are we? We fast forward to December 31st, okay? So this was for three months' rent, so one-third of the $9,000 is no longer prepaid. It's been used up. It's expired. So we want to make an entry for $3,000. There it is. Debit rent expense. Let me post that up over here. And credit prepaid rent. And after we do that, what's going to be the balance in prepaid rent? The balance is going to be six thousand dollars yeah okay so that is a recorded cost it was initially recorded as an asset which is going to either be prepaid or supplies and what's 
that's the entry you have to make. You always have to debit the expense account and figure out how much of your asset has been diminished and you credit the asset account. So it's going to be expense, debit, prepaid or supplies, credit every single time. And you should have done this in accounting one. I'm sure you did. Okay. Now, there is a spinoff on this. Type 1B, let's suppose that instead of debiting uh, prepaid rent, you debited rent expense for the entire $9,000. Okay, so we reached the end of December and we want to straighten out our books. What do we have to do? Well, we say, okay, we don't have an asset, so our adjustment is going to be to debit the asset account for $6,000. And we're going to move that 6000 out of the rent expense, yeah, which will leave us with a balance of 3000 So the observant student will note that we wound up in the same place. We got there two different ways, right? Same destination. So that the means of accounting should, should not dictate uh, how much expense is allocated to each period. All right, so that we have a $3,000 debit balance to rent expense, and we have a $6,000 debit balance to prepaid rent. And that is something you probably didn't do in accounting one. Okay, So it's an alternative accounting treatment. I like the other treatment much better, but it doesn't mean this doesn't happen in the real world. Okay, so that's how we do that. All right, that's types 1A and 1B. All right, unrecorded costs, probably the most uh, common adjusting journal entry that there is. And what is this? This is what's happening here is you have a cost which has been building up over time, otherwise known as accruing, and you haven't recorded it doesn't mean that a mistake was made, it's just the nature of the beast. So let's suppose that you have a $500,000 note payable outstanding, and you're not going to pay the note or the interest until the next month or several months down the road. But you have to make an entry, interest expense, interest payable. Okay, you reach the end of the month, and your employees have worked a number of days uh, within the current month, which they haven't been paid for, because they're going to get their paycheck the next month, you have to make an entry. Salary expense. Salary's payable. Yeah. Okay, so that's how that works. And what's happening? You're having this cost build up over time. It has not been recorded. And when you do record that cost, it's going to be expense payable every single time. Okay. Next on the head parade. Let's be the landlord or the landlady the $9,000, yeah? So we are receiving $9,000 for three months' rent. So what do we do? Okay, so on December 1, we debit our favorite account, cash. And in this case, in this option, we're going to credit liability account, unearned rent. So unearned anything is a liability account, yeah? Okay, so we got $9,000 in a liability account. So there it is, okay. A month goes by, and of course what? Now you've earned 3,000 of that, so you want to record that. So here's how we do it. We debit the unearned rent account. It's going to go over here. And we credit rental income. It's going to go over here. And when we're finished, we're going to have a $6,000 balance in unearned rent, which is the following two months, right? January and February in this case. And we got $3,000 in the revenue or income account, which is as it should be. Yeah, yeah? Okay. Now, on the other hand, what if you initially recorded the cash receipt as revenue or income? So in this case, rental income. Now, you didn't earn all that money, huh? Because this is for three months. So we get to the end of the month, and what do we do? We figure, okay, we don't have a balance in unearned rent. We have to create it. And what is that balance going to be? That balance is going to be $6,000. That goes 
comes over here. Okay. And that also is going to be a debit to rental income. So what happens when you debit rental income or any other income account? You're reducing the balance. And when we're done, what do we find out? We have a $3,000 balance in rental income. And we have the $6,000 balance that we created in unearned rent, which is exactly what we had last time. And by the way, whenever I put numbers in rectangles like that, uh, that's to indicate that that is a balance as opposed to a transaction. There you have it. Okay, so that's a type, and that's a little editing here. This is going to be a 3B. Okay, initially revenue or income. That's what you do. What do you do? You create the unearned account and you pull the fund, the amount out of your revenue or income account to create it. Next on the hit parade, unrecorded revenue or income otherwise known as accrued income or accrued asset. What happened here? Something good's building up over time, okay? Uh, the earnings process has taken place, but you haven't recorded the revenues. What do you do? Debit a receivable account, okay? Uh, so maybe your company is into real estate and you have a commission coming, but you didn't get it yet, so you might debit commissions receivable and commissions income. This could be fees receivable fees earned, something like that. So that's typically the case. Um, always be debiting a receivable account of some kind and crediting a revenue income account. Okay. So there's my four, what a lot of people refer to as accruals and deferrals. Um, and then we have, uh, have a mixed bag of other possible adjusting journal entries, which I'm calling accounting estimates, most of which you're familiar with. Remember this one, right? From accounting one, debit depreciation expense, credit accumulated depreciation. So later on in this semester, we have, we're going to be calculating this, and there's four different book methods we'll go over, and there's also a tax method we'll go over. In any event, once you arrive at the number, what do you do? You make this entry, okay? Now, if it's an intangible asset, like a patent or a franchise, what do you do? Debit the expense account. And to use the textbook treatment, you would credit the asset account. So you, your credit would go directly to, let's say, patents or franchise, okay, which are intangible asset accounts. Could you use an accumulated amortization account? You could. And in fact, on the books that I keep, I do, because I know that the corporate tax return is going to ask for that number. So I always want to keep track of something that I'm going to need at some point. So that's how that works. This one here, we also did an accounting one. There's two different ways of coming up with this entry. Uh, bad debt expense, okay? And this is the contra asset account, allowance for doubtful accounts. So we're gonna do it the easy way here in chapter three, which is what? Um, the percentage of sales method. How do you get this number here? You take the sales and you multiply times the percent that you think you're never gonna collect. So let's suppose you had a million dollars in sales uh, and, you, and you figure that, well, I'm not going to collect a half a percent of that. You multiply and bingo, there's your entry, okay? This one you probably have not seen before, warranty expense. Uh, let's say, God forbid, you're selling Jeeps, right? five-year warranty. How does that sound? It sounds really tragic because we know they're going to break. So we have an account, let's call it obligation under warranty. I'm doing this with a migraine, so you have to bear with me. Okay. That's a liability account. And the balance in this account is going to be equal to your estimate, you being the company, uh, of what it is you think you're going to cost you're going to incur to satisfy the warranties that you have out there on the products that you've sold already. So 
this might, let's say this number is $22,500. That's how much we have in the account. Let me be consistent with what I said to you earlier. $22,500. Let's say that's the balance. And then what do you do? You go about the business of calculating. Well, what do we think we're going to have to expend in the future based upon sales which have already occurred and with, for products which are under warranty? So maybe you come up with a number like 30000 Say, okay, I want this number to be 30000 You're going to need to increase it by 7500 What would your entry be? Your entry would be a debit to warranty expense and a credit to obligation under warranty. Needless to say, if there's like a, a recall, like I think Toyota recalled about 70 million cars having to do with the airbags that kill you when they go, when you blow up. Any event, there you go. So that's a lot of... Uh, little bit of background anyway on adjusting journal entries and you're going to receive this chart um, which goes along with the video and there's another video which actually made for accounting 102 where there are two problems that are solved in the video and they cover the exact same stuff that we're doing here the only difference between the accounting 102 treatment of adjusting entries and what we're going to do is these guys here, these accounting estimates, okay, in Chapter 3. So, that's it for now. I'm sure I forgot to say a whole bunch of things that I wanted to, but I'll get to it at some point. Have fun with this. Much more to come.